during these few minutes of silence. You can focus on something you're grateful for, someone you're remembering, especially today, or simply just the pace of your own breath. They find a comfortable place in your seat. Take a few easy breaths as we settle into our shared silence together. Amen. Will you join me in prayer? Spirit of life and love, God of many names and no name, source of all. We are especially grateful this morning on this National Coming Out Day for the beautiful diversity of the human experience for people of all genders and gender expressions, for people of all sexualities, for people who are out and proud, and for people who are fearful or private, or just embarking on a journey of self-discovery or needing protection. We celebrate the joy of love in all its forms, we glory in the power of love that breaks down barriers, that makes us all more free. We give thanks for the many beautiful ways that people create family and home. Spirit of life, our hearts break for the hurt and the violence done often in your name, in the name of God and in our name too, in the name of the church. We offer sincere apology for the ways large and small, intentional and not, that we have hurt people or been an occasion for people to be hurt. We pray especially today for those who struggle with hatefulness and danger in their own homes and for those whose minds understand that they are worthy, but whose hearts and bodies sometimes yet struggle to feel it deeply and to know it fully. Spirit of life with each breath that strengthens and connects us each to all, breathe power, joy, and healing into all places so that all people 
may be whole. Amen. Our homily this morning is from the Reverend Renwa Hamami, a seminary classmate of mine, who is the executive director of the UU Justice Ministry of California. And they have a word for us today on post-election organizing, staying in it for the long haul. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. As a song leader, one of the songs that I keep returning to, particularly in these days of uprising and reckoning, is Ella's song, written by Dr. Bernice Johnson Regan and performed by Sweet Honey and the Rock. Its lyrics, which I know some of you are already very familiar with, set to music the words of Ella Baker, an organizer, activist, leader, teacher, a prophet in the civil rights movement. Until the killing of black men, black mother's sons, becomes as important to the rest of the country as the killing of a white mother's son, we who believe in freedom cannot rest until it happens. Ella Baker's words in this song are ones she wrote over 50 years ago, but they could have been written yesterday. And I'll be honest, that reality breaks my heart. It leaves me crying out. Will it ever end? For some of us, that question is one that has literal life and death implications that the rest of us cannot fully know. And as much as Ella Baker's words break my heart, they also charge my spirit. Their relevance to today's manifestation of resistance and community reminds me that we are a continuation of something much bigger, much more powerful, much more incredible than this single moment in our history. Our struggles to affirm the humanity and basic rights of black and brown lives in this country and world, they did not begin with us and they will not end with us. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Now, I admit it took me several years of singing these words to realize that Ella Baker probably wasn't telling me, run with the Mustafa Taha Mami, personally to never rest. No, in fact, none of us as individuals should be asked or expected to never rest. But all of us who believe in freedom as a collective, as a community, we cannot rest. Ella's song, Ella's words are a charge for all of us together as a movement to never rest. We cannot stop fighting, we cannot stop creating, we cannot rest until freedom in its truest and most universal form exists in our world. Our faith as Unitarian Universalists who don't all agree on what happens after this life can all believe that what happens in this life matters so deeply that we have been called heretics, broken unjust laws, and probably gotten ourselves on more than one government list to make it known that we will not rest until freedom for every last one of us comes. And to be that unceasing, everlasting, perseverant, irritatingly prophetic movement that never rests, 
We need to reaffirm, deepen, and re-reaffirm our connections to each other as Unitarian Universalists. To remember that if we do this work together, we can not rest. And just as important, to be a true continuation of that much bigger, much more powerful, much more incredible freedom movement, we not only need to sustain our relationships within our faith, but we must build and sustain the relationships with communities and frontline liberators who have been leading the way to universal freedom for generations. We who believe in freedom cannot rest and can not rest when we act as a truly interdependent collective. When we are carrying our load on the way to liberation, remembering that we are part of a movement reminds us that we are not carrying that load alone. Like a choir whose singers stagger their breathing to make sure a single note remains an unbroken sound, or a hospital that runs nonstop with a rotating staff, like migrating geese who take turns leading, following, or resting in their flying formation, we cannot rest and we can not rest until freedom comes if we sustain our connections to one another. We need each other so that when we as individuals do rest, we know our movement towards universal freedom carries on, waiting for us to return and temporarily relieve another of their liberation load. As we count down the days to election day, we know that no matter the outcomes, our work will continue. We will not rest. We can not rest if we take care of each other and our shared vision for universal freedom that is possible, knowing that each and every one of us is doing the same for all of us. And knowing that our collaboration in this moment is a continuation of a movement that knows there will come a day when we, all of us who believe in freedom, can finally rest. He who believes in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Amen. Mid 20th century Unitarian theologian, James Luther Adams, one of the intellectual giants of the last century of liberal religion, writes about visiting Germany in 1927, watching a Nazi parade. When it was explained to him what the symbols meant that he was seeing around, him. He got in a heated argument and somebody told him to be quiet or else he would get beat up. That man later explained to him that if he spoke out, he would face violence. It's tempting, especially as a way to calm ourselves, to hear that story and other stories like it and think, oh, what a terrible thing for those people over there. Luckily, it could never happen here. My beloved church, it is time to prepare ourselves explicitly and out loud for the real possibility of post-election violence and chaos for armed white supremacist groups and voter intimidation and for police cooperation with those right-wing militias like we have seen in other places across the country. Perhaps this is hard to hear and your immediate response is to scoff 
and shake your head at the hyperbole. Perhaps this is hard to hear and your immediate response is to panic. Perhaps though, this is actually a relief to hear out loud in public, in church, not just echoing around the caverns of your mind when you can't sleep for fear, wondering if you're predicting or if you're paranoid. So James Luther Adams writes about visiting Germany and then he writes about asking himself this, what in your typical behavior as an American citizen have you done that would help to prevent the rise of authoritarian government in your own country? What disciplines of democracy except voting have you habitually undertaken with other people which could serve in any way directly to affect public policy? More bluntly stated, I asked myself, what precisely is the difference between you and a political idiot? These are strong words from Adams, no mistake. I find great comfort in them though. It was this kind of self-reflection, this kind of brave examination of his role and his actions, this kind of faith-rooted, clear-eyed rigor that made Adams such a powerful theological voice someone who could look clearly at himself and his compatriots, someone who could assess and encourage, someone practiced in the holding of lofty ideals and in the falling short of them. In the cycle where we aspire and we try and we fall short and we try again. So today your task is to consider your actions and your ideals. What are you prepared to do if the worst thing does come to pass? What is the role of the church if the worst thing does come to pass? What are the disciplines of democracy except voting? He argues it's too individual and too easy that you have habitually undertaken with other people poll monitoring, protesting, medic training, giving money to bail funds, legal assistance, joining your union, phone banking, explicitly partisan political activity. I would also add the disciplines of community, not just the disciplines of democracy, but the, the disciplines of communal life, paying a neighbor's heat bill, dropping off coats to the kids down the street, asking for help when you need it, watching your friends, kids, growing that network of care around you, weaving tighter and stronger the fabric of community, which isolation and division under capitalism attempt to rip apart. How are you offering encouragement to those around you? So that like Reverend Renwa Hamami reminds us, you're connected to a movement that allows for you and others to rest. So whom do you need to text? Whom do you need to encourage? If you're overwhelmed, can you find small ways to contribute? If you're burning out, can you take some intentional time away from media so that you can come back swinging? Between now and the election, our worship life will be much more focused on the spiritual practices and disciplines that strengthen and sustain us through hard times. But today, today we engage in that critical discipline of self-examination, knowing that the answer to our frank questions about what we have done or left undone might point us toward the path of what we must do. And we remember always, because we are universalists, that no matter what we have done or left undone, no matter what we have contributed, no matter what, we are beloved, we are worthy, we are just enough in the eyes of God, we are a precious piece of the interdependent web of all existence, simply because we were born. And it is ultimately in that life-saving, life-changing claim of universalism 
that we find our rest. It is from that place, that place of worthiness and deep connection that we find our strength growing once again, despite it all, no matter what comes. May it be so for you and so for us all. Amen.